our our quality as measured by our quality um, as measured by uh, the quality measure. Uh, so we say that the performance on, on task as measured by the quality measure, uh, which we call it accuracy. So the performance on predicting as measured by the accuracy where on how accurate our predictions are, uh, is improving uh, with uh, experience. E, so it improves with more data. Uh, so uh, this is definition from, from a book uh, from Tom Mitchell, uh, which I quite like. Uh, and yes, that's what we're gonna be doing today. Uh, so sometimes these two are used, uh, you know, uh, like equals, but in reality, uh, artificial intelligence involves a, a bit more than just machine learning. Uh, so the objective of artificial intelligence is uh, that of producing a machine uh, which performs difficult uh, intellectual tasks uh, at the level or beyond the level of a human uh, level of performance. Um, artificial intelligence is uh, a field that includes machine learning, but that also includes uh, other approaches. Uh, the classic approach uh, is uh, what it's called symbolic AI. And the easier way of thinking about symbolic AI is if you are in Excel and build, you know, a ton of if else rules. Uh, well, that's kind of what uh, symbolic AI was. So uh, it was the belief that, you know, we could, uh, we could uh, create uh, a performance uh, that deserve the name AI by having people build into a computer a, a big set of rules. Uh, of course, imagine building uh, if else statements for everything uh, that doesn't seem to be a, a good feasible solution for very complex problems. So, uh, Symbolic AI work well. Uh, I think classic examples are some chess uh, chess programs made, but uh, for more complex trust, uh, tasks, then that doesn't work that well. Uh, so machine learning came to change the paradigm a bit. So before we had rules and data, we did some programming and then we got the answers we needed from a machine. Uh, now we have uh, data uh, and we have answers to the data uh, uh, as we're gonna see uh, our training data sets will have a set of predictors, uh, variables we're gonna use and uh, uh, an output uh, variable, a uh, target variable that is the answers that we want, we want to learn how to predict. So we'll have the data and the answers we're gonna do machine learning and then we're gonna extract the rules with the objective of, of doing those rules uh, uh, into the future using the, reusing those rules say, in other data sets or, 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 or use it again. Um, so yeah, just programs, you know, have, oh, satisfy the, the criteria you know, of, of AI uh, given in, in, in these slides, uh, the performing or, or beating chess human players at, at, at chess. Um, so, you know, you can claim that AI has been achieved. Um, you know, uh, this was a, a special purpose built program and, and the computer, uh, and the computer just uh, be the, a person on 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 a, on a thing, uh, but of course, when you know, uh, at least the initial idea of AI was more related to uh, famous Turing test for for intelligence. So a more global a a AI uh, was probably 
uh, sick there uh, when 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 you know developing this uh, there was an ambition or that uh, a, a computer may may fool a, a human into thinking that uh, that you know they are human uh, but uh, uh, but yeah so you know AI we have is mostly based on on a uh, special purpose in you know beating a, a, a person uh, in chess um, uh, so question uh, do we always need machine learning uh, and Suppose, uh, and it's my question to you, suppose that I ask you to cluster uh, these data points uh, into three groups. Do uh, you think you need machine learning for that? Well, you don't need machine learning for that. I mean, if you were just asked to cluster uh, these in three groups, as you see, uh, this is uh, this is already uh, kind of uh, the simple graph is already kind of has done that. Uh, this is a, a very uh, you know important uh, uh, concept. Uh, because you know machine learning is getting popular and it's always good to take a, a step to think if uh, you know complicated algorithms or, or methods are really needed uh, to uh, find a solution for the problem. So when to use machine learning? Uh, so. Uh, learning from data uh, when we don't have a, a, a we can construct a, an empirical solution that that is uh, data driven uh, and in machine learning we learn from from data and we try to uh, we try to discover the underlying patterns uh, and and we try to discover, uh, you know, uh, those set of rules that we just were talking about, uh, in order for us to to have them and be able to use them in, in new situations. So, when when we do machine learning, will um today will not be uh, different. We'll be you talking about models. Uh, and models in very simple terms describes how variables, how columns in our data set are, are related. Uh, for those of you who com come from statistics, um, you'll think of model as mathematical formulas. These models will generally uh, have a way to be implemented as computer programs. Um, computer programs will have a, a corresponding mathematical formula. Uh, in the very simplest of simple terms, uh, when you write y equal x in math, uh, this is equivalent to writing the line of code y uh, uh, x being assigned to y. So, uh, as a, an example of, of what I, I meant by by this. Uh, so suppose we have what we call an output space, yi, where we're trying to understand, for example, if you're trying to predict uh, the weight of a person, uh, uh, and probably uh, when we're talking about the weight of a person, uh, that input space uh, will, uh, will, you know, probably have the height and Maybe some uh, uh, life, uh, life, um, you know, uh, habits that that might drive the the weight of of, of a person. Um, we believe that there is a relation 
uh, ship between uh, the weight of the person and the data we have, or uh, at least with one of them. And we can model that relationship uh, with the use of a function uh, from uh, our inputs uh, to uh, our output uh, in every uh, in every model. And this is uh, pretty much uh, an explanation of, of a simple regression. In every model, there is some error, uh, some stuff that our model will be able to explain and that error. Uh, we are required to be independent from the excess and to have a, a mean zero. Uh, so the process of doing uh, machine learning uh, is uh, as follows. So we have a problem uh, in one of organizations that we're looking forward to solve. Uh, then uh, we need to formulate those uh, uh, that problem into uh, something that you know, relates to machine learning and machine learning can solve. Uh, this step will uh, help us to, first of all, think about the data we need, which is, uh, I mean, many disciplines uh, build models, but uh, in the case of, well, statistics or machine learning or econometrics, uh, data is a key part of the ingredients of how a model is built. So we'll determine our, our data requirements and then we'll do what, what we call feature ex extraction, which will, well, it will uh, basically uh, help us define those inputs, those excess for, for our model. Uh, of course, the problem formulation itself and the feature extraction process, uh, the expertise uh, of, you know, clinicians in our case uh, is crucial and we always, attempt to incorporate it uh, and uh, uh, at this stage. Uh, so, you know, after we have our feature extraction and we, of course, uh, from the formula formulation, uh, we know the target variable, uh, the Y of our problem, we'll have a training data set. Uh, we'll train a couple of algorithms uh, in, in with our training data set, you know, you check the performance and, and see uh, which one is more suitable to solve this problem. And then we'll have, uh, you know, this formula that will take the excess as, as input and then return a prediction for, for the Ys, the, the target variables. Uh, so we want to build, build the best model. Uh, but what is the best model? So we need a, a definition of quality. Uh, that comes from a decision on the metrics we're gonna use to evaluate our algorithms. Um, that is part of the problem formulation uh, generally. Uh, and always keep in mind that for machine learning, as we say, we want to extract rules and we wanna extract rules that work well in new data that wasn't used for training. Uh, so our objective is to build models that work well on what we call the test data and not the, the training data. So we train the model and then we test the model. Uh, there are many different types of, of machine learning. Uh, we have a uh, Supervised machine learning, unsupervised and reinforcement learning. Uh, we're not gonna see uh, unsupervised or reinforcement uh, learning today. Uh, image processing is a, a supervised task. And as a supervised task, we have two different options that are explained by what the outcome variable, variable look like, looks like. So if you have a continuous variable, well, you will uh, be more in the area of, of, uh, of regression, you'll be in the area of regression. Uh, if you have a qualitative variable and by qualitative variable, for example, we mean a variable that is zero or one, true or false. 
Uh, so we call that uh, a classification problem. Um, today we'll be in this area in supervised learning and the classification problem. As we saw in the initial slide, we'll be using the, the logistic regression uh, uh, or uh, we will see the logistic regression or, or under random forest to do our work today. Uh, supervised learning. Uh, so, supervised learning, uh, we are given uh, a new sample of data. Uh, uh, and this new sample of data wasn't used to train the model. We have uh, variables uh, or, or what we call features today uh, associated with this sample, except for the value of one, uh, one uh, variable. Uh, this variable will now become our y, our target. So our goal is to estimate the dismissing value by, by learning from the values of the other sample. So we have a, a sample of data uh, 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 that you know we have quite a, a, a big uh, you know data set where we have uh, both the the predictors and, and the answer and the, the y to those predictors. Now we're given a, a new row, a new sample of data, and the y is missing, and we're trying to to predict it. Uh, so that that is uh, uh, supervised learning. Uh, we need to build a model uh, that maps the, the features, uh, the predictor. Uh, we need to uh, build a model that, that maps the, the features, uh, the predictors, the variable um, uh, to a, a label, to that Y, to that output that, that we were talking about. And that is our objective for today. Uh, so why are predictive models? really important in health. Uh, well, if we had to think about what clinicians do, I think most of us will say, you know, uh, you go to the clinician and they start thinking, oh, what does this patient have? Well, what is the prognosis? What, what might happen next? Uh, what, uh, what happens if I do, offer this treatment instead of this other treatment. So in, in, in a sense, uh, uh, clinicians are, are trying uh, to predict. Um, most of these questions uh, involve a, a, a good level of uncertainty. Uh, and yeah, so we can be model and we can represent by our probabilities which, which we can estimate. Uh, so these questions, uh, which are uh, almost entirely about, about prediction, uh, show us that you know predictive models that involve uh, domain knowledge while building and have a, a, a place in 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 in, in, in this uh, field. So an example of, of, of what a, a machine learning process uh, will look like. So suppose we want to define if an email will we, we, we receive is uh, spam or not. Uh, we have some features, some variables, some predictors. Uh, we have the email address of, of the sender, the time of the day it was sent. And we have... Uh, Uh, two variables, basically one if uh, uh, the email contains the word prints or the word earn extra cash. Um, and we're gonna use to, to these features basically to you know make a prediction if the email is uh, spam or not spam. Uh, and so yeah, we gather that since we, we want to predict uh, uh, if our email, the email we got is spam or not, well, we gather data from uh, thousands of emails. Uh, we, you know, clean, transform, 
prepare the data for, for our model. Um, And then we split, as we say, we want to train our data and then test our data, and we split our training and test uh, and data and, uh, and training data and test data into two. Um, so the steps we're doing at, at this moment is we're choosing a model uh, to try a couple of models. In this case, two of today we'll try two, the logistic regression and random forest. Uh, we're gonna tune parameters. Uh, you know, some algorithms have the ability to uh, penalize for uh, for over complex models. So the the complexity is just right, and we are we are what we say we're we're not overfitting the model, which is when we have you know high accuracies uh, in, in the training uh, data set and, and a low accuracies in, in the test data. Um, so after this, we, we train the model, uh, you know, we, you know, input the training data set with this equivalent of showing the, the formula, our, our, our email examples. And the model, the training algorithm will, you know, gradually begin to learn the, the relationships between uh, the features, variables, predictors, and the label, the outcome target. Um, of course, after we have this, well, we want to check, we want to, to make sure that our model is good and we evaluate it. Uh, and if not, we go back to the drawing board and begin again. Uh, if our model is good, then well, we'll probably start uh, uh, start making uh, predictions on 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 our unseen data. Uh, so the mathematical formula of uh, simple regression uh, um, by um, it looks like this. So we have the Y, our outcome, our target uh, for the I uh, sample, the I person, the I arrow of data. Suppose we're trying to, uh, as we say today, predict the, the weight of, of a person. Uh, so we know we have an error. Uh, and we know that uh, we have um, a feature, a variable, a predictor that is we call height. Uh, so the height of a person influences the weight that person has. And let's check what these two are. So we call this uh, the intercept, uh, which is a parameter that will be learned by the learning algorithm. And we call this uh, the weight. Uh, of, of of the height feature uh, of, of height, uh, which is uh, what it's also called the slope. Uh, so, as you see, this mathematical formula uh, gives uh, a line, and uh, this line, well. It's close to some points and not, not close to others. So this this uh, this model, you know, uh, has uh, uh, some errors here, and um, and the line uh, is uh, is uh, the the shape of the line. If it's uh, you know, uh, which is like this is tuned and and given by by these two parameters. If you alter these parameters, well, you know, the line might flatten, the line might do uh, other stuff, um, but uh, in reality, uh, the learning algorithm will help you, uh, will help you build a line that is minimizing the, the, the errors. Uh, this is a simple model. Uh, you'll see today with Santosh that, you know, you can have more sophisticated models or you can have 
In this case, model that just don't have only one feature, has many more, uh, and, and, and this will, will, will help you uh, explain more complex problems. So uh, logistic regression, which is the first model we're gonna use, uh, probably uh, logistic regression uh, as popular as linear regression. Uh, so in this scenario, uh, as we say today, we're going to be in, in a classification problem. So our, our data set will be look like a zero or a one. Uh, and and uh, uh, you have a, a straight line. Uh, if, you, if you were doing a linear regression, you will be fitting a, a straight line to it. So uh, in this case, uh, as you see, the strength line can easily go uh, above or below uh, the values of your data points, which can only uh, take your one. Uh, so it's natural to say, well, this won't be a, a very good fit, uh, a very good fit for this data set. So this point here is quite far away from the line. So let's go and look for an, a different shape. So uh, as you see, we have an S curve here. And um, this S curve, well, is uh, much closer uh, to the points where which all start to, to pile up in, in one and zero. Uh, and, and, and one of the reasons why we used uh, logistic regression for this sort of problem. Uh, like we said, we have a, a, a relationship uh, between a discrete var variable and zero or one, true or false, yes or no, and uh, our, our predictors. Um, logistic regression is undoubtedly uh, the most popular uh, method uh, to, to uh, uh, go for this problem. Not, not the one that perhaps performs best, but I think it's still the uh, one uh, the ones most people use. Uh, so bearing a, a couple of things in mind, the, the logistic regression can be uh, you know, express as as the linear regression as we saw uh, with you know the the intercept we had and, and the weights for for our predictors. Uh, the next method we're we're gonna use is the uh, random forest. But before that, uh, let's take a moment to consider uh, what a decision tree is. Uh, in this example, uh, extracted from uh, a picture online, which uh, basically uh, this person has uh, two variables, x1 and x2. And basically the outcomes uh, is uh, blue dot, blue circle, sorry, and red circle. Uh, so a decision tree will, uh, as you can imagine, if you know, if you have the plot at the beginning, this will have no lines like this or no numbers. Uh, but what the decision tree will try to do is, you know, make these partitions, these squares that you see in, in the plot, where ideally uh, in a square, everyone will be a, a red circle or a, a blue circle and will have everything split out uh, that way. But in reality, the decision tree will start by finding these splits that, you know, allows you to, in simple terms, allows you to uh, basically uh, group uh, same classes with same classes. Uh, so, for the random forest, uh, we need to discuss what uh, ensemble learning is. And ensemble learning is, in the simplest of terms, is when you take multiple algorithms and, and you uh, create uh, one bigger algorithm. And
And well, this is a, a very important idea and, it, and it's very powerful because you are using multiple algorithms and you're leveraging those the power of, of having many algorithms working in a problem for in our case to, to, to make a prediction. Uh, in the case of the example we are going to use, the ensemble learning will use multiple algorithms of the same types, uh, of the same type, which will be multiple decision trees. Uh, not the only option, but but this is uh, the, the example we'll, we'll see today. So how the random forest uh, works. Uh, so the random forest, uh, you start by selecting K, uh, uh, K being a, 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 a number, uh, random data points from the training data set. And you build the decision tree, a decision tree, uh, for these data points. Random forest, as we say, builds many decision trees. So after you know you finish one, you go back, uh, select k data points again, and build another one until you build the number of decision trees that you want that you said that 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 you would build. Uh, and then the last step for a new data point that appear that is not, not used for training, uh, we make each of these trees uh, predict, uh, uh, predict where the data point belongs to. Uh, so here uh, in, in the decision tree, you know, we had one split uh, and, and that was the split. I and mean, you know, if a uh, uh, sample falls uh, here where everyone thinks it's blue, well, then uh, we'll classify that as blue. In a random forest, well, we're gonna go through majority voting. So we're gonna ask each of these decision trees what they think the sample should be. Uh, and then whoever wins that vote, the pool, whoever you know gets more, more decision, then it will predict this class. Uh, in, in this visual here on the right, you see, you know, we have uh, the instances, which is another word for, for, for data, uh, the rows, uh, samples. Uh, then we build uh, three, one, two, three, n trees, many, many trees. Uh, and we have uh, the tree, we, we give a, a, that new, new sample, a new data point to, to the trees. And we see that uh, tree one uh, pre, uh, predicts class A, tree two predicts class A, and you know, the end predicts class B. So if we take the majority voting from this, we will see that the prediction made by the random forest will, will be that you know the new data is it's an apple. And I think Santo shall I'll... Yeah, I will present from here. And thanks very much, Bruno, to explain all the methods, all the three methods in machine learning. And then maybe I can share my screen, right? Yeah, hi again. So like as Bruno explained, like there are uh, many models and many possible ways to solve your problem in machine learning. For example, you can use the supervised machine learning and unsupervised machine learning, and sometimes the reinforcement learning. Sets. So it's all depend like what kind of the problem you have and what kind of the outcome you want. So there is always a trade-off between uh, 
the machine learning algorithm and these are always like the two expect to consider when you are designing uh, your model so uh, very first thing you have to consider that try you know, try to fit your data very well very well means like not too tightly not to lose and when i'm saying that tightly and loose it means like the decision boundary of your algorithms and it should be like robust as much as possible so robust means like it should not like it's working it also mean like the re, uh, reproducible so it is not like something you build this model here and then you are shifted to either the computer and running your model there and then suddenly you say oh uh, now a computer is like giving your accuracy 90 percent, and now you shift it to b computer and running the same program and it's like now 80 percent. so these are the very common problems in machine learning algorithm models when we try to build and then the next thing is the the predictor that you have generating using your training data must also work on the other new data so it's not like you have very a nice you train your model very nicely and you are very happy your training accuracy of model is like 98 or 97 percent which is considerably good from 97 to 99 uh, percent uh, ratio but what happened when you trying to like test your model on the actual uh, on on the new data or like the the data which is completely unseen then your model accuracy is just like only 70 percent or 75 percent so uh it should work on all like uh, the, the the new new data set or you can say the unseen data set and then when you create the predictor usually the simple simpler the predictor is the more robust to tend to be the sense of being like able to estimate the reliability so for example if you are working like uh, if you have like number of features for example 100 or 200 and i know that there's a lot of information you want to put inside your model but sometimes the number of the uh, these variables can also introduce the noise into the model so you uh, you you always want to like uh, avoid uh, these kind of problem and then on the other hand, the simplet model uh, is do not fit the training data aggressively. So like there are a lot many fancy models are there, even deep learning models are there. You heard about uh, like a lot of machine learning model and you are confused like this, which machine learning model I should start. So it's my recommendation is like, you always start with the simplest model. Why? Because the simplest model means here, again there's a two kind of model is possible one is the parameter one is the non-parametric uh, model so in the parameter uh, parametric model there are a lot many like you can say the hyper parameter or like the other fitting model fitting parameters are there so when you are uh, like tuning and those uh, hyper parameters then they are fit your model like very tightly i mean they can give you a very nice result on the training uh, data set but again uh, on the unseen data set it can be the drastic so always start your model with the simplest model for example the logistic model and there is another uh, model which is non-parametric model which is called a uh, k-nearest neighbor model which we gonna explain later in our slide uh, in our like uh, exercise so as i said there is, is always a trade-off like uh, between the models so in the in that trade off also we have you have to consider like your training error and the testing error so two kind of the possibilities of uh, the error you can face and th these are the majority of like two uh, errors one is the training error which reflect like how the your data is well fitted into your uh, training model so when you are training then you always check your uh, accuracy and the errors and this is how you will get to know about your training error and then there's a testing error which reflect uh, as i explained like whether the predictor actually works on the unseen or the new data set or not but there is a major problem about in this machine learning is not those training errors those you can control like by having different kind of uh, choosing different kind of models which is like uh, parametric and non-parametric but the all models uh, actually face this problem which is called the bias and the variance problem so the bias is like how good the predictor is the average trend to the smaller with the more uh, sophistic sophisticated models uh, sorry the more complicated models so the thing is 
what is mean is here like uh, the bias can be introduced like the several ways even as a human we have our own perception and it can introduce the bias the another way is like when you are selecting the samples or, or for your model for for samples for your data then it's also like uh, introduce the bias and for example uh, I, I want to give an example here that the how is like the if your data is unbalanced then it can also introduce a bias for example if your predictor is one of very one of variables is like the male and the females and suppose they are uh, the outcome variables a uh, male have the higher ratio for example you have a uh, uh 70 percent data uh which is saying it's about the male and only the uh less uh, rest of 30 percent data is about the female then this is like how the data is or the class is imbalanced here which can also introduce the bias because you're more when you are training when you are going to train this model it will be like more to bias towards the male rather than the female so the these, this is the major problem. And then the other problem is the variance problem. So it's tend to be higher for the more complex models. So the more com the more complicated model you have, you will be have you will have like less bias problem. And the more complex model you have, it will be like it also introduced the, the variance. So it should be like uh, there is there should be a trade off like how much the bias you are allowing into in your model and how much the variance you are allow, allowing into your model. So there is no model which can like 100% remove the bias or there is no model which, which can 100% uh, uh, capable to uh, handle the variance. So you have to choose like the bias and the variance very carefully and there is also no straightforward formula or straightforward rules like this much bias and the variance you can allow so it's also depend on your like the problem uh that the, the domain you are trying to solve your problem so why this bias and variance are that much important to handle as i explained like there is a, a problem into the the system also which it can also introduce another problem which is called the overfitting and the underfitting problem so if you have like high variance problem and low variance it will be underfit and if you have like a model which is have like a uh, uh, low low bias and higher variance then your model will be like the overfit so you want your model which is not to overfit not to underfit so you want somewhere in middle and then there also should be like a trade off between the empirical uh, risk and the model complexity so the empirical risk is like an error rate based on the training data and increase the model complexity is like decreasing the empirical risk but it should be like less uh, robust towards the higher by variance problem so if our model is like too simple and it has very few parameter then it is a higher chance that it, it will get the higher bias and the low variance so for example as i said like if you have a number if you have a large number of variables or uh, sorry the parameters are there then uh then you you will get like the high bias problem and on the uh, another hand if your model has a large number of parameters and it is going to high variance and low bias so we need to be find out as i said the good balance between these overfitting and the underfitting problem so this trade off in the complexity is where is a trade off between the high uh, bias and the variance and algorithm cannot be more complex and the less complex at the same time so you have to choose like very wisely according to the domain you are working how much you are allowing uh, how much the trade off you are setting off so the uh, as i said like the bias refer to the error that can introduce by modeling a real life problem and that is usually extremely complicated by much uh, a simpler problem so uh, bias like can have like at least 18 or 19 kind of bias are there in the machine learning so and there is no like statistical formula or any mathematical formula again where you can calculate like how is the bias the only thing is like you can do your data exploration part and uh, uh, do the like some kind of such, uh, various kind of such statistical analysis where you can like just uh, detect like whether you have the bias problem or not 
So generally more com uh, flexible and the complex uh, machine learning method is less bias uh, uh, towards there. And the variance refers to like how much you estimate the function would change by if you are having different kind of uh, training data set. And generally the more complex, flexible and the complex uh, machine learning method has the more variance uh, problem. So this is an example, like when I say your model is the overfit or underfit. So this is like overfitting model. So it's like, you can see the data points in blue and this is the boundary line in the zigzag, you can say. So suppose you have a two classes is Y and X, and you can say it perfectly cover each and every data point. So this is an example where your model is like overfit because it is too far perfect. So there's an example, like there's a thing like nothing is perfect in, in, in this entire universe. So don't rely on model if you get like get 99.9% .9 or 99.8% accuracy that 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 can be the reason of like you having overfit your, your model uh, while you are uh, training it. And then you have an underfit, uh, you can see again, we have a high bias problem. So you have a data like uh, again there is uh, there there are uh, blue points which are the data points are there so our model has not considered all the data points so it's left like lot many uh, data points on the horizontal lines uh, upset uh, on the upside and then there is a perfect example of like where you have a low bias and a low variance but this is not the clearance real scenario in the machine learning when you are building uh, your your model so you can see like we got a curve here as a boundary to uh, to divide like our two classes y and x but the thing is like you can see it covering like most of the data points are here as a boundary but is uh, it also uh, like leaving the data points so it is not like uh, completely overfit or like underfit problem so this is the like idealist boundary we want in the machine learning when we are classifying into the two category so this is uh, th this was uh, uh, the introduction for the, the machine learning model and the, the, the problems or the things we need to consider while building a model. So I'm here open for the questions. If you have any question to this point, and then after that, we will move for uh, our practice session where we gonna uh, see like how we can utilize uh, these model to to something like to solve the real problems. So any questions or anything so far? Well, if there is no question, uh, no doubt, then we can go straight forward to our uh, practice session. So our practice session, I already uh, upload all the script and the data uh, under the R Studio Cloud. And there is our goal is to like build a predictive model using the R for whether someone had the collect uh, collateral uh, cancer based on the abundance of different bacteria in their stool uh, microbiome. So this is the publicly available data and we are going to practice it for building a model for predicting uh, collateral cancer. So uh, I hope all you have access to NHS Confess 21 introduction ML folder. Please let me know if you don't have. And then there is a folder is called collateral cancer. You can just click on it.
Can anyone see my screen? Yeah. And I hope everyone in our studio cloud. Are you all there? Okay, I'm, um, I'm, I'm assuming like you all are there and there's a one script or you can there, there's a one file, it's called readme file. And if you get access to it, this file, then, then our goal is to like to predict the collateral cancer using microbiome data. So as I explained, like we have an open source data uh, set, which is about the collateral cancer based on the abundance of different bacteria in their stool uh, microbiome. And there, so they have the features, and the features are 16 as RNA gene abundance uh, clustering to outs and uh, represent the bacterial uh, abundance. And then we have a label. So this is the uh, dependent and independent variables for our uh, problem. And the health outcome is whether a patient has a cancer or not. So it's a kind of uh, binary problem to classify whether someone has a cancer or not. So for this, uh, we are using mainly uh, two algorithms. Uh, one is the random forest, which Bruno explained you, and also the logistic regression problem. So if like someone want to access the data, then this is the link uh, for the data where we got, but we already placed into this repository. So you need to install a few libraries if you don't have. So we are rely on the carrot, which is a machine learning uh, regression and classification uh, library mainly. And then we have a tidyverse, which is for manipulation the data mainly. And then another library is a uh, random forest. So can everyone check if it is there? Or maybe first I'm gonna explain like what this code is doing. And then later uh, you guys can uh, run your code and let me know if you have any problem. So what we are trying to do, first we are reading our data here. So as you can see the read, uh, and th this is the command we are using read.dilim and we have a data format in TSV file and we want to the explore the data. So we just want like five columns and uh, five rows. So this is how the data is look like. This is our the target variable, which is uh, named as the cancer. So you can see zero is like someone don't have a cancer and the one someone has a cancer. And then these other variables are, uh, are, are the variables which are gonna help to predict uh, uh, cancer or, or not a cancer. So these are the features here, which is uh, related to RNA genes. So what we can learn about the data. So the, there are two rows, different sample, each and different person. And the first column is whether, as I explained, if someone has a cancer or not. So this is called a label. And then these are the their stool, stool samples where they are uh, trying to uh, see. Uh, this data is about like stool sample and then uh, in specific like the uh, abundance of uh, microbiomes. Yeah. So these we call the features. And now, here we are checking like how many samples do we have or how many features we have. So 
this is about the target variables like we are seeing here the data imbalance problem which can as i explained this can also introduce the bias into the model so we want to make sure there is no bias in our more in our data so zero is like uh, a person has no cancer and uh, one is like person has cancer. So zero is has like 172 patients are there. And for one, there are 120 patients are there. These are not exactly like the same in ratio, but this, I mean, this is not like we can consider something it's biased. Suppose it has like 180 and here is only uh, 80 or 70 samples are, uh, are there, then we can say it's a bias problem. So we can consider is there is no bias in data. And then the next thing is we have to check the data, whether is there any missing uh, data uh, or, or not. So we simply run the command like sum is dot any and data. This is the command to check whether you have any missing value or not. If so, if, if we run there and zero, uh, our outcome is there. So it means we don't have any missing value. So we don't have to remove the samples. So there are like various, if suppose you have your missing values, then it will be appear here, like how many missing values are there. So in this case, you can do the two things. I will simply remove those uh, instances which have the missing values, or you can use like the imputation method. Uh, each of one having like their own drawbacks uh, to utilize it. So, for example, if you are removing the instances which are missing, then you are throwing a lot of information away and which can be useful for the, this prediction problem. And if you are doing the imputation problem, this problem is also sometime introduce a bias into the model. But we are lucky to here do not have any uh, missing values. So we don't have to do any uh, steps here. So now the next thing is we have to split our data set into the two set. One is the training set and other one is the testing set. So the training set is the main data where we are going to utilize this data to uh, uh, going to build the model, uh, which is called the training model. And then the rest of data is testing data. We will keep aside. We will never see this data during this training process. So this is called sometime also the unseen data set or the target data set. So uh, the next step is like we split this, this data into the 80% and the 20% in the two, ro two ratio. So uh, the 80% is for training and 20% is for testing. So some of may, maybe you have a doubt about like, is it the correct, I mean, what will be the uh, ratio and how to choose the ratio? So there is not like hard and fast rule to choose the ratio is all depend on your data. And when I say all depend your data is means the quantity of your data. If you have very large amount of data, then sometime you can divide your model into the training validation and testing. We are not going there, but yeah. So if you have very large amount of data, then sometime you can do like 70% uh, and 30% ratio sometime, uh, uh, just like 65 and 35. So it's all depend on like how much data you have. But if you have a small data set like we have, then you need a large amount for the training and then less amount for the testing. So, and yeah. So after uh, splitting this data into the two part training and the testing, now our next goal is to utilize this training uh, data set and uh, build a model predictive model and we are going to use this uh, algorithm which is called a uh, random forest here first and so why we are choosing with the this random forest as i said it's it is the kind of reliable model so far so that's why we started from this random forest and this is the pipeline we are going to follow uh, to build our model on test our model. So here we have a data and this data we divide it into the two part. One is like the training or validation you can say. And the other one is the test testing one. And then this uh, training data, we can further divide into the train and the validation. 
And with the training, this training, we have to do the train the different hyperparameter settings. And in the validation, we also do the hyperparameter settings. And then we evaluate like which hyperparameter uh, is the best uh, for our model. And then we got this train. Uh, and at the last, we will get uh, the train model with highest performing hyperparameter setting. So hyperparameter setting is again the same thing. Uh, is like when you have it because it's a parametric model. So it's it have a lot many parameter to tune the model. So here we want to control the bias and the variance problem. We don't want uh, too much bias in our model and we don't want like too much uh, variance in our model. So this these hyperparameter will help to control those bias and the variance. And you can say also it will uh, help to reduce the training error uh, for our model. And then later we're gonna evaluate this model on this unseen data set and gonna uh, if, uh, see like how this model is exactly performed. So as I said, we need to have a held out data set or you can say the test data set that will not use into the training model to create our training data set. We will need to uh, make change to our data. So first, we need to change the label column to the factor. So you have to check like what kind of the variables you have uh, inside your model and you can simply use the command str and then the name of your data set. This will tell you what kind of variables you have, categorical variables or numerical variables or characters. And sometimes you need to process uh, your, your variables ac according to the algorithm. So we need a definitely our target variable as a factor because we are using, we are, we are doing the classification. So we need like one and zero, uh, the binary, or you can say the factors. So this is the command, like you can convert your uh, target variables into the factor. So we have a data and data is like our data name and then we have a variables target variable which is called cancer and we are going we are now converting into a, a factor variables and we also want like randomly ordered samples so we are like shuffling our uh, variables we don't want like the same kind of for example uh, if data is available related to the female, so we don't want our machine learning algorithm to read all the data like first female and after about the male. So we want like suffering the data so that our model randomly learn about the male and the females uh, uh, data. And then the determine the number of training sample, like how many training sample we have, we can use this command and then it will give you the training number of training sample. So after that you are using here the creating the training set so here we are giving the random order i mean we want uh, we want to select the train data but into the uh, uh, into the random or, or you say the random format or the you we can say the random samples so it is not like you will get all the data into the trading just about the female and the very few about the male and all the test data is just about the female. So this is like uh, your, your model is not gonna perform very well because it is just trained on the one certain class. So that's why you are doing the shuffling here. And then once you create the training data set and then you pass your remaining one. So you, for example, we uh, hear the select the number of training sample plus one. So it will start from after the training data set and the, till the end of number of your uh, variables. So we got like a training data set and the testing data set. Now the rest is like you have to train your model. So there is also a parameters to you have to uh, explain like how, how much the uh, hyper parameter or you can say uh, tuning parameter you want. So there are mainly two hyperparameter or the tuning parameter in random forest. So first we are using random forest model. So random forest, this is your target data and then target variable. And this is the rest of data you are passing for the training. And this is the entry. Entry means, uh, as Bruno explained, uh, random forest is create like a lot many trees. So how many trees as initially you want to create it? So we want 500 trees. And then empty 
uh, R y is equal to is like how many variables you want to uh, assign to each and every tree. So we are saying because it's a default default value is like also 500. So we're just using the default variable uh, values. We are not doing any uh, specific hyperparameter tuning here. So we are putting everything by default. And once this model is trained, now we are trying to predict here and we are writing the command caret command. So this is your trained model and you are now testing on unseen data set, which is your test data set. Now we want to check like how, how well your model is performed. So here is, we wrote down a function uh, for checking uh, all the stuffs. I mean, to get, uh, get the accuracy. So the actual one is like the actual number of the patient having the cancer. And this is the predicting one. The predicted one is like the, our model has predicted. And then there is a comparison between the actual and the prediction one. And, and then this is how we are uh, accessing the accuracy for, for our model. So while checking this accuracy, we got 0.7758%, which is somewhere a 78%. So now again, is a question like, is this 78% accuracy is good, good enough or not? So, sorry, my... Yeah, so we were here. Okay. Yeah, so we want to see like whether this uh, seventy percent, seventy eight percent is is uh, enough for the accuracy or not. So uh, for this, we want to do. Uh, hyperparameter tuning and also want to introduce like uh, the cross validation mod method so the cross validation is method is used basically for remove the overfitting or to check whether your model is the overfit or not so we want to make sure like our model is not the overfit so the cross validation is like you have a, this training set during the training, you have one training set, and then this training set will divide into the um, further uh, into the five parts because we use the number of five uh, here is equal to five. You can also use the number six, seven, eight, ten. It's it depends on your data how large is your training set data is. But we divide into the five five parts. So this cross validation will do first. It will it will divide the training uh, data set into the five equal parts. And then at the first iteration, it will uh, train on your model on four. Uh, suppose you have one, two, three, four, five uh, chunks of data. So what it will do first, it will like take as a test, uh, as a training as a test and as the first one, and then uh, check the accuracy of the model on the rest of the data. And then second time, it will switch to the second and third and fourth in the loop. So this is like how the cross validation method is, is, is make sure like your model is not overfit. So it will check for the all five chunks and then it will uh, take the average uh, of the accuracy from there. So th this is like kind of uh, a validation inside that your model is, is trained uh, very well and it's not overfit. So, we use like cross validation method and we also use like the grid method to figure out like what will be the best uh, value for this my tr my tr again like number of variable you want to assign into each tree so this grid search method is like the it will search automatically the optimal number of uh, your my tr parameter so that's why we put here between grid and we introduce like uh, cross validation method and then the number of trees. So these are the few parameters are new in comparison to the previous model I explained. So this is how you are doing the hyperparameter tuning here. And once your model is trained, then 
it will show you the final one. So it is saying like when you are using 500 MyTR, which we used previously, then your accuracy is 0.73. And when you are using the 1000 MyTR, then uh, your accuracy is 0.74. So as I say, we use like these two at the moment, you can play as much as you want, like number of parameters. So it is like a uh, trial and run uh, uh, thing. So you have to just make sure, I mean, there is no like constant number of uh, variables, uh, hyperparameters, uh, like you have to put 500, 600 or 700 or 1000, 2000. You have to just try like which one is uh, more giving better one the accuracy. So uh, our final model is trained on the MyTR uh, metry, sorry, 1000. So the 1000 is better than 500 and the cross validation helped us to uh, also to achieve this accuracy. And now we are predicting our this trained model. And after that, we got the uh, accuracy here, 70. 5.8 and earlier was how much? 7 0.778, 0 0.78. So again, uh, you see here you have 0 0.78, per, uh, sorry, 78, for, suppose you have 78% when you are not using any uh, cross validation method, but it, it got dropped when you are using a uh, cross validation method and it's became just like 75% that it's an obvious question from you or anyone like that if the accuracy is decreasing then why we are using this cross validation method it is not just about the accuracy it's about like how well is your model is behaving and the behave means here is like underfit or the overfit so definitely the accuracy is decreasing, but at the same time, we make sure that our model is uh, not overfit. And the benefit you will get to know when you are going to test on actual uh, unseen data set. So here, like the prediction is like uh, how well our model is behaved. So for example, uh, sorry, this is the random forest one, is this one? So it's saying like you have 10 classes and so you have total 11 classes and it's a, it's a cancer and the non-cancer, this is sorry, non-cancer here. So it's saying your, yeah. So cancer and normal is non-cancer. So you have a number of total uh, can, uh, cancer patient is like 11, but out of 10, it's saying like, 10 is correctly uh, predicting like it's a cancer and only one is like uh, misclassified as, as a normal. And here as a normal one, you can see it's, it's the total number of uh, 47. In that they are saying the cancer, it's saying as a dot cancer 13 and normal non-cancer to non-cancer is predicting 34. So our model is more like uh, is, is a better when you are trying to, you, you just want to care about whether someone has like the cancer or not. So this is how this model is, is doing. If you are care about like whether someone has this, uh, just, just about like whether someone has, don't have cancer, then uh, this model is, is, is not good. So uh, we just want to try another model, not for the uh, like, not, uh, I mean the another model as like logistic regression. So we passed like G element, it like the binomial form of this model and is a uh, multi, uh, sorry, non-linear model uh, as we have a, more than one uh, variables inside the model. So we use this GLMNet as, as a carrot format to uh, access the uh, logistic regression model for the classification. So this is our target variable. This is our training data. This is the uh, metric you want. So the metric is here is like, you want to evaluate the metric on what, what basis you want error from the model. I mean the training uh, model error. So it will show you if you are 
write down here the error then it will evaluate in terms of the error not in terms of the accuracy the another thing is you can also uh, pass here the roc curve so roc curve is like uh, uh, a curve between the sensitivity and the one minus specificity so but here we are not doing the error and roc we are just trying to see the accuracy so we write down the accuracy and this is the control parameter we are passing so this we are using the cross validation method five times and any kind of uh, parameters we can you can search randomly we are not passing here and so the results is is like uh, we got this is a hyperparameter as we say you can search randomly so these two hyperparameter it is searching one is the alpha and other one is the lambda which is defining the the boundary which i have shown like in the graph when we were saying like overfitting and underfitting so if you have alpha value is 0.12 and lambda value is 0.71 then accuracy is 0.64 so it is saying the best one you will get like when you have uh, alpha value is 0.12 and lambda value is 0.31, which is the second one, then you will get 0.69 accuracy. And if you're gonna classify here, then your accuracy is 0.81 on the prediction one. So this is your training one and this is your testing one. So your testing accuracy is 0.81. So, and the specificity is 0.97 here. So here is like zero is non-cancer and one is for the cancer one and is only have a one misclassification here and it's completely reversed to this random forest one. So even in what we are concluding here, we, we compare the two model and the two model giving like different kind of accuracy. One model is very good when we are more focusing is someone has the cancer. The other model is, is the best when we have like not, we are focusing on non-cancer. So even like a simple binary classification, it's all depend on what class you are more interested. So yeah, so th this is like how we can compare and we can see the results and we can choose a particular model of our interest according to the, the problem we want to solve, according to the problem we have. So this is, uh, this was uh, an example. And if someone want to run this, then they can simply run. Here, for example, they can choose line by line. If you want to read the data, then just say read your data and your data will be here. And if you want to see your data, how this data is look like, then you will get your data here. So if I think you can run this and if anyone has problem, then please let me know. Or you have any question, then please ask. Any questions? Any doubt? Santosh, I think it would be a, a good moment for a break now. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so we will get back in 30 minutes or 20 minutes, sorry. Yeah, let's say 11.30. Okay, yeah. So we will be back at 11.30 and we are going to start the second part about the image processing. Yeah, just to say, uh, I think we'll, we'll go to lunch some, uh, sometime uh, at round one. That will be the next break.
So the, there's the one question about the confusion matrix. So the confusion matrix is gonna change when you are going to change your hyperparameter, when you are going to change uh, your twinning parameters. And if you are running the same code every time, then your confusion metric will not change if you are not changing anything uh, specific to your parameters or, or the model. Yeah, if there is no question, then we will meet again at 11.30. Thank you very much, all of you to join it and see you later.
we will wait three more minutes and then we will start our next session Hello all, welcome back. And I'm assuming like everyone's there again. So before starting uh, this second session on image processing and computer vision using R, if anyone you have any questions or any doubt or any comments related to the, our previous section about the machine learning, then most welcome. Okay, in case there's no comment, then we are going to start our sec second session, uh, which is image processing and computer vision. So during this uh, talk, I'm going to explain about the background of image processing and computer vision, and then a uh, bit code and practice for image processing, especially how we can transform the images, how we can manipulate the images in R. And then last, how, uh, last is about code and practice for pneumonia diagnosis using X-ray image classification, X-ray images. So it is about the classification of someone having uh, pneumonia or not uh, by looking into their x-rays. So we all know a picture is like speak more than uh, 100 words as you can see if I'm gonna ex tell you to like explain about this image you probably gonna write about lot many uh, different perception over a uh, text but in your own imagination is very simple like it's uh, all about the kids and toys even more like a picture can even uh, say about like ten thousand words not even thousand so here is like all 
this image is all about like emotion, actions and reaction, everything is there. So this is how like the image are so important for us. So if we talk about first the human vision, then we can do amazing thing. For example, we can recognize people and object based on our learning and we can navigate through the obstacles. We can understand the mood in the scene and imagine the stories, but still there are some limitations as a human uh, vision we have. And those limitations are, for example, we can't like see like if someone is suffers from the illusion, we can't ignore, uh, we, we like as a human vision, we ignore a lot many details and we are ambiguous about description of the world from the, our own perceptions and we doesn't care about the accuracy of the word the accuracy of the word means like how how we see whether we are seeing the same perception or not uh, that perception is actual or not so what is computer vision can uh, what what is the computer vision in simple terms people have a different different uh, definitions for example some say it is about the inverse optics optics and some say the intelligent interpretation of imaginary or the images and some say it's like building a, a visual cortex and no matter what is your definition is the computer vision is really hard but uh, believe me it is it is really fun also at the same time so this is a typical example like as a human how we see an image it's an Einstein image, for example, for uh, for us, but as a as a computer, as a human, it just are like sorry, as a computer, this image is just about the uh, numbers. It don't care about the person, personality. So it's beyond the biasness. And yes, uh, it's not only see these number very uh, straightforward actually the computer see an uh, image as, as a matrix or as a vector or as a array you can say so the computer vision is all about the scenes of the perception and it's it's, it's combination of lot many things for a computer uh, uh, vision so for example if we see this image of einstein it's just an einstein image and gray image probably the second opinion is the gray image, but as a computer, it's a lot many details are there, a lot many depths are there. For example, the intensity of image, the contrast of image, gamma value of image, and the edges, and a lot many details, uh, segmentations are there. So it is, it is not very similar like what we see in an in a, in a image. So, uh, the computer vision is 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 about mainly uh, these uh, five things. One is like the image. When we say computer vision, then we consider mainly these five uh, things. Like very first one is the image processing. In the image processing, we read the image uh, to the computer. We analyze uh, the statistical property for the image. We do the transformation, transformation, we analyze a uh, different aspect of the image and uh, we process the image to, to, to utilize for something, some application uh, within the computer uh, vision or computer science. Then uh, it's about the classification. So classification is like very simple. You have a lot of images and you have to just classify whether this image about the cat or not. So it is called the single object uh, classification. It can be multi object classification. For example, if you have a multiple uh, subjects or, or the objects inside your images. And then uh, uh, it is about the semantic segmentations. So segmentation is about the outlining or or or, or detecting another like edges and uh, draw the, the lines inside the image to 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 segment uh, the image. For example, here, it, this is like simple cat image for the classification. But if we look into the more details, like it is not about 
uh, object is just like about the pixels, then probably we have a three different uh, segment. One is like you can say the grass, other one is cat, tree, sky. So it, it can be it, like we can extract like lot many uh, information from this image uh, using the segmentation. So for example, if you're interested in the cat, you simply extract uh, the cat image from there using the uh, segmentation. If you are interested from the background which have tree, then you can simply extract the tree, sky, or grass. So yeah, this is like the uh, semantic segmentation. And then uh, the classification plus localization. So the classification and localization is a very similar, or you can say the extend version of the image classification. So in classification, we are like only interested into the object to identify or the classify. Sorry, yeah, uh, to the classify whether that's a cat or not, but in the classification plus our uh, localization, we are interested into whether it's a cat or not, but the same time, where is the cat? Uh, in in this image also that so this is called the localization and classification problem and then other one is the object detection so the object detection is again very similar to like first we have to do segmentation for the object detection and then uh, the next step is the object detection after the uh, semantic seg segmentation so here you have a multiple objects into your image for example they are cat Christmas tree also there, dog is there, cat is there. So this problem is uh, is called like uh, object detection where you have to identify more than one or more than uh, one object. And then instance segmentation, like again, if you have multiple objects are uh, there, once you identify and you want to remove uh, some, or you are interested in particular object in that particular image, then you can do the instance segmentation. So the instance segmentation and is, is very popular in, in the imaging, uh, especially the uh, radio imaging, radiographic imaging, where you are interested into the tumor and then you have to segment, you have to do first the image segmentation, then the image registration. And after that extract the, the features related to that image. And if we talk about the radio mix images, then there are uh, features, for example, uh, shape based feature. We have to do the intensity, uh, intensity based uh, feature extraction and texture based velvet decomposition image feature extractions are there. And after that, once you get all the features and then you apply the feature reduction algorithm to remove the noise from your images or remove the uh, noise from the features and then apply simple machine learning algorithm. So before all this detail, let's see like what is uh, image processing. So the image processing is the way to convert an image to a digital aspect and perform certain function on it in order to get enhanced image or extract the useful information from it. So it is not straightforward. You have some image and you want to apply for some imaging algorithm or like uh, for imaging application. You have to do uh, as like in data, we have to do the data cleaning, data processing in the same thing. The image is also a data in the different format. So you have to clean the image, you have to uh, specify, specify into the image what information you are looking for because a, image, a, a simple image can have a vast number of information. So it's all about like what particular information you are interested. And then image processing basically involves uh, these three steps. One is like importing the image obviously into the, the, the program or, or the application with the image detection tools and R have some libraries for it. We will explain it later and then exploring and manipulating the image. So exploring and manipulation means like what kind, again, what kind of the information you are looking for, whether this information is very clear or not. If not clear, sometimes you have to increase your brightness to focus on that particular part. Sometimes you have to decrease the brightness. So all these uh, manipulation we have to do in the image processing. And then outcome, it can be like improved or reported that is built on the image analysis. So these are the mainly uh, three steps into the image processing. 
and there are two parts of image info, uh, information process one is like the geometry of information uh, formation sorry so the how the image is formed uh, is is based on the two principle one is like geometry of image formation which determine where is the image plane the, the projection of the point in the scene will be the location uh, will be located so the image is like made of the pixels so the pixels have like certain plane uh, the geometry into three dimension space of the plane so you have to do like uh, identify what what coordinates you are looking for what coordinates you are interested in. and then the physics obviously uh, which determine the brightness of the point in the image plane as a function of illumination and uh, surface property so one is like geometry perspective we have to look into the image and then second one is the physics which is called the light so there are two models of the image processing uh, mainly one is the rgb model which is the adaptive uh, color model and one is uh, cmyk uh, model so rgb is mainly like the three colors red green blue colors are there and in cmyk which is uh, is a subtract subtractive uh, color model which is like uh, canon uh, canine and uh, magenta yellow key black colors are there so uh, but most of like the image processing are based on the rgb model so an image is following the rgb model is represented by an array and array is m in m into n into three so where m is a number of pixels of the image height and n is also a pixel of width and then three is like the plane uh, dimension of the matrix and three matrix below giving like the red blue and uh, green component of each pixel pixels of the image so every pixel every image pixels have the three matrix uh, basically every three colors have like different uh, matrix one is for the blue other one is for green and then uh, for the red so how it is like what is mean by all this matrix or all this model so suppose we have a pixel called coordinate which is called ij in a plane and then we code it as a tuple into xi ij and xi the blue red and green and taking their transpose so for example if you have a zero zero and zero all for blue black and for the red sorry blue black and green then this pick then this pixel will become like black but if you have for example first tuple one and then second uh, for example the red one is is there and the rest of two are not available or you can say the zero values are there for example for green and blue then it will be a perfect red the another one is for example your red one is zero your green one is one and your blue one is zero and you're taking the transpose then your pixel will become like a green and the next one is the same if you have only blue available and rest of two are not there then it's a perfectly blue color but what happened when you have all three available then the combination will become a white and how about it's not like perfectly binary zero or one so suppose you have 0 0.972 for uh red color and 0 0.95 for uh, 0 0.05 for green and 0 0.1 point sorry uh, 0.147 is for blue then it somehow become the yellow uh, pixel so the pixel formation is depend on the coordinate and the coordinate has a matrix of three uh, values and in this three value you have to look like which is available and which is not so this is how the computer understand the image and image have like have different data formats one is the vector format so the vector describe uh, geometric uh, elements that compose the image using the appropriate language and optimal for basic for example if you just want to have shapes curves functions and math plots then those are in vectors and you uh, probably use uh, those format for example pdf eps and 
desktop SVG format. And then you have another format is called the uh, raster format, which described a complex uh, pixel positions and the color. And it's uh, optimal for the real world photography or the applications, for example, dot uh, TIFF and JPG, PNG and BMP. So these are the more details formats uh, of the pixels are available in, in, in this format of image. And then we have a list of R packets for image processing, but in realistic, if you are doing the image processing, then people are not prefer R, but still they have some libraries. And, but, but honestly, like Python is the best language to follow uh, if you are doing the image processing thing. So, <coughs> sorry. So the R package for handling the image, mostly uh, using the low level code is JPEG format, PNG, for, uh, PNG PMP, and GL, uh, GR import package are there. And for the R package for general image uh, uh, processing task, you can use uh, magic tick and uh, imager, ib image and open image R. And for if you have a domain specific task uh, uh, application or program, then you can uh, utilize CRI image package for tumor detection, FFTW for Fourier transformation, radio mix texture analysis, and many other uh, packages are there. And if you are using some kind of API or bridging or interface based uh, R packages uh, application, then you can use like R OpenCV, which is uh, very similar to Python OpenCV. And and also, yeah, C++ uh, Delib library, you can also at, uh, utilize. So these are the some name of uh, our packages are available there. So uh, like how we can uh, use a package, for example, JPEG to read the image. So there is a, as a R package, as I said, for JPEG. So suppose you import one library, JPEG, and this is your uh, the variable where you want to store your uh, image. So you just like write down, you want to use JPEG uh, library and that library has a specific function is called read JPEG. And then you define the source, where is your image and it will gonna import your image. And then uh, once your image is stored in this variable, my image, then you can manipulate uh, your image according to uh, your need. So for example, if I say the first pixel is, is like, I don't want there. So it means I don't want green and green. I just want like blue one. So all the pixel will be like reduced to zero, uh, green and red one. And just, I will get the blue pixel inside the image. And then what other function you can use? You can also uh, utilize the histogram to see like how uh, your image uh, sit statistics is look like. So histogram, despite count the pixel of and given intensity, it could be pl plotted for the uh, gray pixel in grayscale image for each color channel, red, green, blue, respectively in the colored image. So this is like, uh, for example, a gray uh, image of the Einstein. And this is the pixel instance intensity it's showing here. So it's like the absolute frequency is very high for the uh, gray 0 0.2 uh, intensity here. And then you can also do uh, manipulation of contrast and brightness of the image. So what is the brightness? Brightness is overall level of pixel in, uh, in, in in, in insights of an image and then construct and sub subjective difference between the darker and more intense uh, uh, pixel. So if you consider like a grayscale image, then uh, for example, you have a coordinate I and J where you have like number of uh, M coordinate for I and N coordinate for J. And if their in intensity I, J belong to zero, either zero or one, for the gray level uh, pixel uh, with the coordinate of ij, then you can adjust those intensity with this formula, aij alpha, uh, alpha dot 
AIJ minus 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5 plus beta. So basically either you can do 0 0.5 plus or 0 0.5 minus. This is how you can manipulate the image. So if alpha value is greater than 0, it means the more contrast. If it is like 0, alpha value is, uh, so it is greater than 0 and less than 1, then it means the less contrast. And same is with beta value. So beta value greater to zero means the more brightness. If it is a less than, then it means the less brightness. So this is like the two parameter alpha and beta. You are going to utilize to uh, increase your contrast and decrease your contrast and also increase the brightness and decrease the brightness into the images. So for example, we set the beta value 0 0.5 and just we want to check whether like, uh, for example, if my image, if beta value is, is uh, greater uh, than one, sorry, less than one, then it is like one and you have want to check your beta uh, value there. So it's like increase your contrast and here uh, there's an increasing uh, histogram for the contrast value. And this is like, you can decrease the contrast here and you can say your the contrast is like more towards the zero. And sorry. So this is like uh, uh, we're gonna practice uh, later how we can increase and decrease the contrast by uh, manipulating the different uh, uh, manipulating the alpha and the beta values. So image data and machine learning is is uh, basically. There are the two approaches to build a, uh, uh, build a model uh, using the imaging data. One is like using the traditional machine learning model and the other one is like the deep learning uh, model, which is, is quite uh, famous these days uh, for building the deep learning model for images. And the difference between is like in traditional machine learning model, we have a, like steps, for example, we have an input or uh, you can say we have images, then from that image, we have to do this, all the image processing and feature extraction task manually. We have to define the features manually. We have to define uh, the transformation and everything related to processing uh, uh, by ourselves as a manually. And then uh, once it is done, the future extraction, then we apply it to a uh, interested uh, classify a model and then do whether, for example, here it's just simply whether it's there to predict whether it's a car or not. So first we have to extract all the features related to the car. And then you have to pass those features to your machine learning model. And after that, after testing that uh, trained model, you will get to know whether it's a car or not. But in the deep learning model, your feature extraction and your classification is clubbed together. You don't have to do uh, the feature extraction uh, part. So deep learning is very helpful when you are uh, defining like very uh, micro level features. First, it will do the abstract level features and then it will do the lower level features by itself. And there are many uh, successful models, for example, convolution uh, neural network and and uh, recursive uh, neural network models are there, which are doing extremely good in the machine learning, but, oh, sorry, deep learning, but we are not uh, gonna explain here about the deep learning part. What we will utilize our traditional machine learning algorithms and extract the features related to it uh, later uh, during our practice session. So in, in the traditional machine learning algorithm, what we have to do, for example, we have a training images. Suppose you have x-ray images, then you have to extract the features. And those features are, are like the pixel labels and local labels and the global labels. So three kinds of features we have to extract from the image. And then later we have to combine those three kinds of features. And once you combine your features, then you have to apply the feature dimensionality because maybe there are some correlated features are there which gonna make your model noisy or make more complex to learn or it will take more time when you have a large number of features. 
And once your features reductions are ready, you can pass it to as a classifier model, and then uh, you can do your predictions. Uh, suppose in the X-ray images, whether someone has a pneumonia or not. And uh, so that as a training and testing part, both you have to do the similar things. You have to extract all the local level features, and then you have to uh, do the feature dimensionality reduction thing. So yeah, so yeah, but if you are using deep learning model, then you don't have probably don't have to do these all the steps. All you need to just create a, a well suitable model with number of layers, and it's depend on your data, how many layers you want in your deep learning, and the deep learning model can itself uh, handle this feature extraction and combine of feature and feature uh, reduction or task itself. So, uh, but we are rely on at the moment, uh, traditional machine learning one. So the classification of the image begin with, as I said, extraction of the suitable features from the images. And uh, there are uh, three levels of feature extractions. One is the global level, local level, and the pixel level based. So the local level features are extracted from the small sub images from the original images. So for example, uh, the original image is there and there are like lot many objects are there. So we have to first extract the local features are there. I mean the kind of abstract level one and then the global level, it can be extracted to describe the whole image in an average fashion. And then a low level one extract uh, from the images and the local patches of the color, texture, and the shape based feature, which I explained in the radiomics part. So uh, these are the few steps as I explained here. So now we are going to practice about uh, image analysis and processing part using a library which is called uh, Magic library in R. So let's see how to play with that. So for that, I have created one image processing folder here. Same problem. Is anyone else or able to open this folder? Okay, seems to be me. Strange.
probably my connection problem. So I think we are there. Yeah, so for this, you need two libraries. One is the magic disk and one is the test rect. You have to simply run this. As you can see, both libraries are installed. So we have a one image already here, which is image one, this image. And it's have all three colors of our interest is blue, green, and red. And let's read this image. It's simply follow this. So your image, you pass like where is your image is there. So you say like my image, and this is a library, and this is you reading the image inside this library and this is the path of your library sorry the image and then you print your image here your image is there and if you want to plot your image even you can do plot my image so it will be plot your image here and you can say like here it, it this image is 300 into 300 pixels and so now let's write this image into the gray one. And so sorry, before that I want to show you this one, the simple one. So this is like, again, the library, same thing. We remain, we uh, read our image from here. So is native is false. So why false? The image is represented as an array of the dimension, as I explained, uh, X and Y height and width channels. And if you make it true, then this will be like as will be read as a native raster. So for example, here I try to not pass any uh, variable, it's true or false. So it's by default is false, uh, it's true. So that's why it just re uh, reading this image as a as the image itself. But if you pass this like native is equal to false, then it will be read as an array. So you can say here we have a large array. So it's not like this, this is an image, but it's an array format. And so firstly, let's like, uh, we should, uh, let's initiate a simple canvas for this. So we create the similar kind of width X and Y. So for example, this image was 300 into the 300. So this is also creating a simple white background, 300 by 300. And then, now we are going to pollute this empty canvas with our image. And this is our image is here. And let's see like, uh, now let's try to represent the, the color representation and let's try to play with it. First we say like the class of your image. So which is array. And now check the dimension of your image. So this is the dimension is uh, this height and this is the width. And it's a three dimension array and the color matrix is red, green, and blue. So if I ask you like, just so the, show the red intensities in this color image. So here, this is the red one. So first one is available. This is second one, third one. And this is seven and eight one. And this is how we will show you. So this is like, now if you want to reduce the red color, suppose we temporarily uh, save this image into the temp image and we want to check the histogram for this image. 
So this is the like red intensities are there. We want to just reduce it. So we will put like simply uh, all values to zero, the red color and check it whether it's on a red or not. Yes, it's all red. And now check after reducing the red color. I should plot it. I should plot it, maybe some problem. Yeah, so it's like this, these are the commands few where you can uh, play with your images. If you want like, if you want just the red one, green one, and just the blue one, then as I explained in this the presentation part, you have to just uh, put one value is available and other two is, is, uh, is zero. Plot it. I don't know what's the problem. Maybe some library conflict or something. So the idea is here to show like how you can manipulate the images. You can practice here. This is the all commands. You can decrease the brightness. You can increase the brightness. For example, this one is increase the brightness. And this is after increasing, decreasing the brightness, the image should be here. Oh yeah, sorry, it's a decreasing. So you can see our original uh, brightness was this image. And this is after decreasing your brightness. And you can even check the histogram. So it's all towards the zero. And if you want to increase the contrast, you can manipulate the alpha and the beta values. And then you can see the contrast is increased already. This one is, if you decrease your contrast, this one is increase your contrast. Sorry, brightness. And if you want to decrease your contrast, and So this is contrast decreasing. Same like you can play with the gamma value increasing and gamma decreasing. I can show you how to look like as a gamma increasing. So this is like absolute frequency for the gamma. So this, this is a, a basically the idea like how to do the basic uh, manipulation into your images. And this is all the magic uh, trick uh, commands basically for uh, our libraries. And you can play, uh, even you can like increase the hue and brightness and uh, saturation uh, image all together by simple writing like you want a brightness 120 saturation 50 so it's it's a very similar like what you do in it's very similar like what what you do 
in like a image processing in in your phone when you take the image sometime you have manipulate uh, your images uh, before putting to the instagram so this is like basically uh, the idea behind those manipulation these commands and you can play with them x is taking some time. I know this might seem like a stupid question, but um, in terms of the fact that we're manipulating the images, is that basically just to get them into better shape so that we can then apply the models? Yes, exactly, yeah. So sometimes what happens if the image is not clear, or for example, the object is not very clear in which you are interested, and uh, interesting, and you want to like uh, extract, uh, for example, the information from that particular area. So sometimes you have to increase the contrast from the images. Sometimes you have to decrease the contrast. Sometimes you have to rotate your image so that you can extract that particular feature. Thank you. Yeah, so this is the idea basically behind all the image manipulation. So image manipulation is, as I explained, is a very similar like data pro uh, before uh, putting the simple data like numerical data, you have to do the data cleaning and data processing stuff. You have to sometimes scale your data is the same thing. We have to sometimes scale our images. We have to do the manipulation before inserting it to the model. Yeah, so these all are the commands are here. You can play later by, uh, you can rotate your image. So I have wrote down all the, these commands. You can rotate like 45 degrees. So these are like very basic commands were very useful commands. Like if you are doing the image processing stuff later. So this all all about these things. But our main, uh, main goal is not to like do the image manipulation but to see at uh, so we have now uh, a real life example for the image combination of imaging and the machine learning basically how we can utilize uh, machine learning for the imaging uh, data to solve a problem. And I'm assuming it will take some time like previous. So here is a like a uh, real life example. I got this data from 
Basically, there is a one paper where they mention this data, and uh, it is also a open source data. It's about the diagnostic uh, tool based on the classification framework for screening the patient X-ray. And uh, to quickly and accurately identify the pediatric uh, pneumonia from uh, linear uh, uh, chest X-ray images. And this data is basically available in Kaggle, if you heard about it, Kaggle community. And uh, the explanation of is all data is available in this uh, link, which is a very well published and cited uh, uh, paper for this uh, problem. And so this data is contained about around uh, 6,000 grayscale images, all the X-ray images, and containing uh, three data sets already. Uh, they divided into the training, validation, and testing. But uh, due to the huge amount of this data, for example, it is more than one GB data as an image, image data. So uh, it's have like a lot of uh, uh, space requirement also to upload. So we are considering here only the training images and out of total, they have like 5,216 5, uh, label images are there. And, but we are not considering like the other two data set for the validation and the testing. We just considering here uh, training data and then we are creating our own data set from this training data set and dividing this training data set into the training and the testing. So in, in short, like I don't want to, I, I mean, I'm not considering the entire data set. I'm just taking a small chunk of data, which is like a training data and then for this training data, I'm converting into my own training and testing. So now for now we have like, uh, with this way, we have like 300, 3,875 uh, pneumonia classes and 1,341 for the normal uh, classes of X-ray images. So before starting, we have to, uh, utilize uh, our libraries. So we are using the tidyverse library to manipulate the data frame. And we are using to one, one more library is uh, our EPR, which is for resizing the plots. And uh, again, the carrot model for the classification stuff. And then we having an imager to linearize the image into a data frame uh to display the, uh, these images so after that now we have our images here so next we are utilizing the source of imaging the data is already uploaded into this cloud and uh, First, we want to read and see like how is data is look like. So let's start here. So these are our libraries. We can quickly run here. And then we are loading just, as I said, we are just loading the training one. So this is our training. This is a directory we pass. And this is the Yeah, so this is like to see like how the images are look like but the original size of image is like uh 2090 and uh, 2090 into 1858 pixels but we don't because if we are taking this image it will be like very heavy processing for us so we want to uh, reduce the pixel size but make sure the quality will not decrease so we just copying the image into the 20 into 20 pixels so that we have a uh, we can uh, reduce the significant amount of the computational uh, uh, time. So here is like 
we are doing the resizing. Once the resizing is done, we want to see how is the resize is look like. And this is the resizing one. So for a, for a human, for us, like we see, we see like uh, this picture is looking really great, but this picture is not not really looking this this much great but think about as as a computer side maybe the contrast is going to decrease but still there are a lot of information is here in the pixel wise the low label uh, lo uh, local uh, label wise so uh, we will get all the information from here and then after that once we reduce the size and then the next step is what we are trying to do. Yeah, now we are resizing our images. And the next step is like we have to create our, our data frame. So we have to transform these images into the data where we can apply our machine learning algorithm. So we an initialize one data frame and fit every picture from normal group into a row of a data frame. And this process is called the line linearization. For example, if we split the image into the 10 row and the 10 column, we will have a value of a shade of every pictures in 10 row and 10 column. But then we will uh, uh, linearize uh, the image to make a single column of with uh, 200, sorry, single column with 200 columns. So uh, the idea is like, we want to create uh, the, those three dimension image and, and transform into the one particular row, for example, all the features for a normal and the, all the features from uh, for, for the pneumonia one. So we simply have to run this. So these are the variables we got from the images, the X1, X2, X3, X4. So this is like all the 50 variables we come from uh, the, the, this image as the features. And then this image, uh, this is the data wrangling part where it's going to fit every picture within uh, uh, within this data, uh, for example, we created these 400 variables. Now the next part is it's gonna read up uh, every picture one by one and gonna fill those 400 variables for this image. So it will take a bit time. Throwing some arrows.
it will take like few minutes to run. And then later we're gonna add like uh, zero as, as a, a categorical variable. So zero will indicate a normal class. And once this training will be done, we will take a test one and then we're going to create the same process. First, we're going to resize our images. And after that, we will linearize our images. And then we'll set like one for the test image. So once this testing and the training data will be done with the labeling and resizing, we're going to merge this data together. For example, we have the pneumonia, uh, X pneumonia and the Y pneumonia. So the X one is like the pneumonia available or there is an X, sorry, normal one. And then is a pneumonia for the abnormal one. So once we combine this, then later we're gonna again split our data into the training and the testing part. So in the training and the testing here, we are doing 75 and 25% because we have a lot of, uh, we, we want like more training data to uh, train it well. And once this training is done, then we want to, uh, so split this training in the testing one here. And then we want to build our uh, nearest, uh, K nearest uh, neighbor algorithm. So we haven't explained it earlier, but this uh, K nearest neighbor algorithm is also called a KNN algorithm. And the KNN is like a simplest machine learning algorithm, uh, algorithm, mainly for supervised learning. And this is a supervised learning problem as we have like uh, labels zero and one for pneumonia and not having a pneumonia. And uh, this uh, KNN is also a non-parametric algorithm, means there are no assumptions on underlying data. So we don't have to uh, take care about any hyperparameter tuning or any, any parameters there. So the idea is like the KNN assume the similarity between the uh, new data points and available data points. And then it put the new data points into the categories that are the most similar to the available data points. So it's have like few steps. First of all, we have to uh, select the number of uh, K neighbors, how many neighbors we want. And then we have to calculate uh, the distance from each of data points using the equilibrium uh, distance of this K neighbors. And then the uh, K neighbors will be like uh, divided into uh, the certain categories. And then again, it will check the distance of each categories and then assign a new uh, uh, data points are labeled according to the who has the highest number of K neighbors. So this is like working principles of uh, KNN algorithms. So we can see our training data is done with the label. And now we have to do utilize the test one here and do the similar steps which we have done. So this steps is like combination of few steps for first one is like resizing the images. Second one is le linearizing the images. And then third one is to assign the labels according to uh, according to the data. So earlier one is was for the train. We, we selected the training and we select as a normal. And this one is we are taking the testing one and then selecting as a abnormal one. So it, this is not like real training and testing we gonna uh, insert into our algorithm. So once the training and both testing done with the labeling, we gonna combine all the training and the testing data and then randomize the uh, all the instances. And then we select uh, our training and testing and splitting like 75 and 25, 75 for the training and 25 for the testing one. Yeah, and someone asked me like uh, previously about if you are running your uh, program in R and uh, whether you will get the same uh, confusion metrics or not, or you can say the same results or not. 
So it's if you are not, not setting the seed uh, into the R, then it will randomize the variables uh, uh, into the R and you will get the different results. Even if you have the same program, you are not changed anything, you will get a different, slightly different uh, uh, results. But if you are setting the seed value in, at the initially, then you will get the uh, similar kind of result. So the seed is basically uh, uh, used, utilized for the pseudo random number generate, uh, generator, uh, which we defined. And after that, it used for the reproducibility. So, you, so that you will get the same results every time. So this is how you like set the seed in your program before uh, start building a, a model. So now our training and the testing is done. And here, and here we are combining training and the testing using the R bind function. So DF pneumonia is done. And we have problem in DF. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, 401 for normal, 401 for pneumonia. Yeah, now we are going to combine all two. And these are combined. Now we are creating our actual training and testing data. So this is how the training data look like. So this X1, X2, X3, all the features are there. And if we look into, sorry. X train. And this is our Y train. Is so this is a combination of zero and one. And now we will like model. So I, as I said, first you have to define like how many uh, K nearest neighbor you want. So we are selecting from one to 21 and want to run it and see like how many we want and the K is here. So we will check like from one to 21 and we'll see like how the algorithm is performing on different uh, number of uh, variables. And here we are passing the nearest neighbor one. We are using pipe cross validation method here. 
and KNN, we are using the model and the tune grid is, is not a hyperparameter, it's just a requirement to initialize the algorithm, K. Okay? So K we given like from one to 21, because we don't know which one is most suitable uh, nearest neighbor, whether only just one data point, two data point, or three data point, or 20 data point, or 21. So we want to search first just one to 21. And then we will see like which one is the perfect one for this. So this will tell us like what is the optimal value for k nearest neighbors. Once we get the optimal value, we will utilize that value uh, in our algorithm and then we'll retrain ag uh, again on that particular optimal value. So let's plot our data and see the accuracy. So it is showing like when it has uh, near one, then this accuracy is 0 0.92. When it has three, then accuracy is 0 0.93. And for five, it's 0 0.9, uh, sorry. Uh, 0 0.9338 something. And so the highest value, the point is the highest uh, value we get for the K is equal to 10. So this is 0 0.94. So this is the optimal value of K nearest neighbor uh, parameter. So we are gonna choose the K for 10 because it is giving the highest value. And here we are passing the optimal value for K and then we are running our KNN model again on this optimal value. And once our model is trained on optimal value of K, now we can, this model will be re ready to uh, do the prediction on test data. And then we will access the performance.
Yeah, now it is trained. And now we're passing our predictions from the trained model and analyze how it's gonna work on test. So we got the accuracy of 0 0.92. And this is like how much is misclassified is 19. It is saying it has the pneumonia, which don't have pneumonia. And for these one, it's have 77 misclassified, which has pneumonia and, and saying not having a pneumonia. So, but the specificity is, is all right, but the sensitivity is, is a bit low. So this is like an indication that we can improve our more model. But before that, we want to see like how, where, what are kind of the images which our model is not predicting very correctly. So this is like all the correct ones. And the count for correct is one two zero seven and this is the wrong classified one which is 96 and so the number of images which are misclassified are 96 out of them the seventh image ninth image 10th 15 22 and 28 are misclassified and we want to look at like how it is. So this is the features which for the misclassified of the seventh image. And this, so we want to compare like which one is the correct one, which one is for the wrong one. So we have to access one wrong image and one the right one. So this one is the correct image, which is correctly classified. And this one is the wrong one. This one is wrong classified. It has pneumonia, but it's saying it don't have any pneumonia. And this is has pneumonia and say it has pneumonia. So, but we can't see any difference like with our human eyes, but if we convert into the gray scales of these images, then probably we can see the differences why our algorithm get confused. So this is like more clear view for the human eye to check the wrong one and so these are the two so it's like this here is the predictor our gone wrong and it's not able to classify whether very well whether these images are uh, correctly classified or not so the thing is like we need a better uh, feature definition here to extract the features and then probably then we can increase the accuracy of our algorithm from 90, 90 which is currently like uh, 92%. So this is an example like how you can utilize the machine learning and imaging all together and can solve the real life problems. Anyone have any comments or any question, then please free to ask.
Any comments, any questions, any doubt? I will recommend you to run those scripts. And uh, still, if you have any problem or anything, you can email me or Bruno for any clarification or any suggestions. I think there are questions in the chat, Santos, if you can see. Yeah. So one question is related to the rest of the image on the same canvas. Go back to it. OK. Uh, I, think I, I think it's all one. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, then, uh, thanks all of you to join. Hope these two sessions is like helpful for you and you learn something from those sessions. And uh, let us know, me and Bruno, if you have any question, you want any clarification or anything, most welcome. And Bruno, you may give your closing remark to this workshop. No, that's fine. Thank you all. Thanks all. Bye. See you tomorrow at uh, another workshop. Thank you. And then, bye. Take care.